Hello everybody, welcome to the last day of the Monero Village. If you are just wandering in here, you arrived just in time for a talk by the world famous Kathy Hume, who is going to give us a deep dive into bulletproofs. Now, if you are a swimmer, you may be, you may be familiar with diving deep, but um, diving into mathematics is a lot it's a lot different, and uh, you come out just as exhausted, but it's, it's a different form of exhaustion. So Kathy here is going to very gently, gently take us through bulletproofs, um, and uh, I hope you all come out the other side smarter, because all of this is going to go over my head. Kathy, please, please be gentle. I'll use my lapel. Hi, um, all right, I'm Kathy. Uh, for some context, I worked on uh, an implementation of bulletproofs in Rust, uh, both at Chain and Interstellar, and uh, we have the fastest implementation in existence, and so I feel like maybe that makes me qualified to just tell you a little bit about how bulletproofs works. So maybe before I begin, there's a lot of stuff that I can cover, and what I cover is largely like determined by what you guys want to hear. So what I submitted to this talk was, let's like go really deep into the math of bulletproofs. We can do that, we can also like do less of that and talk more about the things we built on top of bulletproofs, what other people can use it for, uh, maybe proposals of like what Monero might be able to do. Uh, so maybe by like a, a show of hands, how many people are here because they really want to just like get deep in the math? Oh, okay, cool, let's do that. And then if we have extra time afterwards, I'm happy to sort of talk about other exceptions over that. Awesome. So, um, the motivation of why we care about bulletproofs. First, I guess we should talk about why we care about zero knowledge proofs. So, for some of you, this might be redundant, but I'll just cover um, some basic ground first. So, a zero knowledge proof is a way to make a proof about, uh, sorry, a proof that a statement is true about some input without revealing what that input is. So that might be a little confusing and abstract. One example of a zero-knowledge proof is a range proof. So a range proof is a proof that a certain number is in a range, usually like 0 to 2 to the n, and uh, you can show that this proof is true without revealing what your number is. So instead of revealing your number, your like, actual secret, you make a commitment to that number, and that commitment is binding and hiding, uh, and you can show that commitment to someone without revealing your secret. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about range proofs, actually a lot more about range proofs, so don't be too intimidated yet. So um, probably a lot of things you're familiar with, but in a blockchain transaction that's not confidential, this is what it looks like. And the important thing for validity of this transaction is that your inputs sum to the number that's equal to your outputs. So here you can you know, visually check that 5 plus 4 equals 3 plus 6, you're not making any extra money out of thin air. And if you wanted to make this confidential, um, there's many ways to do this, but one, one pr pr proposed way is just called confidential transaction, uh, proposed for Bitcoin. And a broken way to do this would be to uh, use an additively homomorphic commitment and just say, well, now we're just going to do A, B, C, and D, which are blinding and hiding for our secret values. And then you just check that A plus B equals C plus D. And this will be true with very high probability, if and only if, your interior secret values actually sum up to the same value. Uh, now, can anyone tell me why this is broken? Anyone? What's that? Yes? Uh, there is, that is true, there's a very small chance that this can be incorrect, and this is because of the way that you have your commitment scheme, but that's like such small probabilities that that's actually like not something that we're going to worry about. What about you? Exactly, yeah, so like this works and everything, but if you have a negative number, this also still works. And so this is still like technically correct, but definitely not correct in the context of a blockchain financial transaction. So we don't want this to be possible. Um, and for those, those of you who want to like understand the math better, uh, when I say a negative number, uh, it's actually a negative mo number mod p, and so what this is a, basically equivalent to is ex an extremely large number in your prime order group. And so those two uh, statements are equivalent. So you could be allowing someone to spend negative one dollars, or you can be allowing them to spend this like p minus one, where p is very large. Um, so that's uh, just to be technically correct here. 
So what we want to do is to insert a proof, a range proof, that all of your secret values are in a certain range. So uh, as long as your range proof is from zero to a number that's still smaller than your prime order group P, then this will make sure that you don't add any like negative weird numbers. So th yeah, that's one example of how zero knowledge proofs are useful in the blockchain context. Obviously, there's many other ways to use them, and there's also many ways to use zero knowledge proofs outside of blockchains too. But you're probably interested in the blockchain applications. Uh, and why do we care about bulletproofs? So bulletproofs is a pretty cool paper, came out in 2017 from Stanford, and it gives us a lot of uh, properties that we really want in a blockchain context. So uh, what we really want is a constrained proof size because all the nodes have to receive a proof and verify them. And bulletproofs provides a pretty constrained proof size O of log n, where n is the number of multipliers. It also gives us really fast verification. So uh, that's important because, once again, you have to have all nodes sync up. And uh, bulletproofs provides fast verification that also allows you to batch, which means that you can verify multiple proofs in parallel more efficiently. And aggregate, which means you can combine multiple proofs into one proof that they are all correct. Uh, and then lastly, this is a really nice property and sort of a big differentiator from ZK Snarks, for instance. You can have ad hoc logic that doesn't require trusted setup. So if you wanted to create a custom smart contract, for instance, you don't have to have a trusted reference string that requires your setup ceremony. So that is a big um, uh, thing that is appealing about bulletproofs and a uh, big pain point of using ZK Snarks. And I know a lot of like more recent zero knowledge proof protocols such as ZK Sharks, which is great, the H is for hybrid, um, actually gives you a hybrid mode between bulletproofs not requiring trusted setup and ZK Snarks requiring trusted setup. So uh, that's just like a fun side note. But basically at the time when we were looking to implement zero knowledge proofs, bulletproofs was the thing that definitely made the most sense. So what we wanted to do was, well, first of all, understand the paper so we don't just blindly implement it. And then second, once we understood, uh, then you know, implement it using really best practices and existing libraries in Rust, and then make it really performant. So you're all here to hopefully understand the paper, so let's dive right in. This is what it feels like to read the paper. Uh, we have sort of some assumptions, for example, like we would like to prove that E is in range. And then it just gives us this like massive multiscalar multiplication, and you're like, what is going on? Oh my gosh. So I would like to hopefully give you a path between step one and step two. Uh, so let's, um, and when we tried to figure that out, it took us actually like a month or two of just like whiteboarding out possible hypotheses of how we get from step one to step two, and being like, no, that's wrong. No, that's still wrong. Okay, we actually like came up with something, and then we wrote up all of our notes online. So if you listen to this talk, you want more information, or maybe you listen to this talk and you're confused about some points, we actually have all of the notes for this online at docinternal.org.rs. Um, also, I will post the slides online too, so don't worry about finding all the URLs. Um, and then, oh, the last thing is that after we understood all of the math, Oleg went with his graphic genius and made a cyberpunk uh, visual of how all of the math works. And so hopefully we can come back to the slide at the very end and be like, oh, I understand all these transitions. That would be really great. Well, most of them. Uh, cool. So the most um, fundamental building block of bulletproofs is this inner product argument. So uh, this is actually not unique to bulletproofs. This was uh, introduced by a previous paper out of UCL. Um, and bulletproofs just made this three times more efficient. So what is an inner product? Uh, an inner product, for instance, C is an inner product of A and B, is uh, entries, the sum of the entry-wise multiplications of vectors A and B. Uh, so for some uh, syntax, in this slide and in the bulletproof paper, bolded, uh, number, bolded uh, letters represent vectors. So here C is the inner product of vector A and vector B. So, naively, if you wanted to prove to me that C was in, equal to the inner product of A and B, and you had A and B, how could you do that? Like, just shout out some ideas, like super naively. How would you do this in like O of N space? Yeah, you could just send vector A, vector B, and scalar C to me, and then I could do, I as the verifier could do the multiplication. So obviously this proof would be O of N, uh, over in space because you know n is the length of a and b. Uh, the thing that in, uh, bulletproofs introduces is a way to do this in o of n time. 
and oh, sorry, a movement space. So what this looks like is first you start out with vectors a, b, and your scalar c. Then you split a and b into two halves. Then you take this random scalar x. And right now you don't have to worry about where x comes from. All you have to know is that it's not zero, because if it's zero, then you're like screwed. Uh, and it's totally random, like you cannot predict it ahead of time. So you take this random scalar x, and you multiply it by the first half of a, and you multiply the inverse by the second half of a, uh, sorry, the second half of a. And then you get this um, a prime, and then you do a thing with b prime. And a prime and b prime are now half the length of a and b. And then you then get this like big mess for c prime. But actually watch this, this is sort of magic. Because of the way that we selected the inverse and not inverse for a prime and b prime for x, we can actually simplify this mess of c prime to be equal to the inner product of a low and b low plus inner product of a high and b high plus like some garbage. And wait for it. This, the inner product of a low and b low plus the inner product of a high and b high is by definition of inner product proof the same thing as the inner product of a and b. So do you see like what's, what's going on here? That line is actually the same thing as c above. Wow. <laughs> Wait, okay, Does, can you raise your hand if you like understood that? If you don't, I can repeat, because I feel like this is a really critical part of the understanding. Okay, cool. Uh, so, sort of, sort of. Okay, so, um, yeah. Good, I'm getting to that. So, uh, first, we, we appreciate that the math works here so that you actually have C in your representation of C prime. And then you have this garbage. So this garbage, you have to just commit to it. So let's call um, the thing underlined in green L and the thing underlined in red R. And then we send those two, so there are two um, points. We send those two points to the verifier. And you just say C prime is equal to the C from the previous round plus X squared plus times L plus X negative two times R. Um, so, in summary, this is one round, and in one round what we have achieved is that we have half the size of A, half the size of B, and committed to two points, that's a constant number of points. So from like theory of computation, if you do a halving every step, and every step you do a constant number of commitments, then you have a pro protocol that takes O of, N, uh, o of log N space. So I'm gonna follow along so far. Okay, cool. So this is actually like the, the core nugget of what makes bulletproofs so efficient. Now you can, uh, for very long vectors, A and B, be able to make a proof that C is the inner product of A and B in O of log N space. Instead of before the only options were O of N space or something like on that um, order of poor performance. Oh, and then at the very base case, we have, you know, A prime and B prime are just single, um, single scalars, and you send you know, the, the single A prime and B prime, and the prover, uh, the verifier checks that that's equal to your base case C prime. Cool. So that, that's, that's sort of uh, it for the inner product. Uh, and then just so like, as a recap, if you are the prover, now you have received one L and one R point for every one of these steps. And then you've also received the C prime. So you effectively like reverse this process, and you build up what every higher C is using the L and R from that, uh, from that previous step until you get to the top level C. And if your top level C is equal to the C that you expect, then you're like, wow, this all verifies perfectly. So that is our core building block here. Uh, before we move on, any questions about this? All right. Um, so I did skip some things. Uh, so one thing that I skipped is how we actually get the x. I told you don't worry about it because all you need to know is it's not zero, that it's random. Uh, in practice, we use the fiat Schmier heuristic to get these challenge scalars. Uh, what we actually do is we bind the x to all of the things in the previous round so that you can only get this random x once you've committed to everything before, so you can't actually maliciously choose this x. So that's something that I didn't talk too much about. Um, if you're curious about it, I can explain more. Um, I also didn't talk about how operations are actually over commitments, over the plane values. In all of these examples, I just use the plane A and B, but we actually are operating over adversely homomorphic commitments in the exact same way that in our earlier 
example for a confidential transaction, we're actually operating over additively homomorphic commitments when we check that they add to the same amounts. Um, and then the last one is just a performance thing. I, uh, we use multi exponentiation to have faster verification. Uh, but that's you know, um, not fundamental to the math, it's just like cool performance speed ups. All right, so we just covered the inner product building block. And now you might be wondering, like, why do we even care? Like, why does it matter that C is the inner product of A and B? Whatever. Um, and the reason that it's actually really cool, or why we care about this form, is because we can actually, by applying math and cryptography to a statement, we can represent effectively any statement as an inner product. Uh, if you don't believe me, I'll show you with this range proof, and then I can also show you with um, our generalized constraint system proof, uh, which therefore reduces from any statement. Um, but uh, let's look at the range proof first. So here, what we want to do is we want to start out with a statement of range. Zero is less than or equal to b, which is less than 2 to the n. We want to like do some things to it, tbd, uh, until it's in the form of c equals the inner product of a and b, such that if and only if, uh, sorry, such that if c is equal to the inner product of a and b, then with very high probability, v is in range. Cool. Is everyone on board with this mission? Any questions so far? All right, so now we're just looking at this like in-between math and crypto stuff. All right, so the first thing that we want to observe is really interesting. So uh, if v is in range from 0 to 2 to the n, then v must be a binary number of like n. So in this example, if v is 3, v is definitely in range between 0 and 2 to the, 2 to the n if n is 4. So you must be able to represent v as a binary number of like 4. Cool. So as a like mental exercise, you can try this with any value between 0 and 2 to the 4, and you'll like see that, yes, indeed, it does work. And then if you try to represent something larger, so 2 to the 4 plus 1, you'll see that you cannot actually fit everything in these boxes. Cool. So like by definition of binary numbers. Um, so I think this is pretty cool, first of all. Um, any questions so far? Is anyone like, if you, if you don't follow along with this, you'll be lost with the rest of this explanation, so I want to make sure everyone's on board. Don't be embarrassed. It's like, it took us at least a month to figure this out, so like, don't be embarrassed. I'm covering it in like two minutes. Um, cool. So, um, we now have v of 3. This is our secret value, and we want to prove that it's between 0 and 2 to the 4. What we do is we call the binary representation of v a sub l, and this is like what the paper uses, so I'm just trying to be consistent. And then we can say that v is the inner product of a sub l and 2 to the n. Remember, inner products can be of any two vectors that are the same length. So here we're actually representing uh, v as an inner, pro inner product. So maybe some of you are thinking like, whoa, we've actually like jumped from this v in range all the way to an inner product statement. Are we done? I wish. That would be really nice. Uh, no, we're not done. And the reason for this is because if this is your only statement, you can actually do something malicious with your a sub l. Does anyone have any guesses as to like what you can do with your selection of a sub l that would be malicious, that would allow you to make a value that's outside of the range, but for whom this inner product argument is actually true? Yes, exactly. a sub l, nothing about the statement v equals the inner product of a sub l until the n requires that a sub l is actually just binary. So if we had like last digit or the first digit is 100, then v would be a huge number, but this inner product statement would still be true. So what we want to do, oh, whoops, I actually have slides to walk through all of this. There we go. So here's um, some examples of v. What we want to do is basically add another statement that a sub l has to be binary. And the way that we do this is we create an a sub r. A sub r is the bits of a sub l minus 1. So if we have 0, 0, 1, 1, then a sub r is negative 1, negative 1, 0, 0. So this has a really like neat property where if you multiply every bit of a sub l uh, with the corresponding bit of a sub r, then if a sub l is only bits, then you'll get a vector of zeros. If a sub l is anything else, for example 100, then you'll get like 100 times 99, and that's not a zero. So this is actually a statement that 
make sure that um, a sub L is comprised of what bits. So now we have three statements. One being like the vector is actually a sub L times uh, inner product of two of n. The second one being uh, a sub L times a sub R equals zeros. And the third just being the definition of a sub R. Cool. So how's everyone doing? Does this make sense? Why we introduce a sub R? Cool. And obviously you can combine steps two and three into just like one statement without defining a sub R. But um, we tried to do that and then realized that that breaks the protocol because you have to separately make a commitment to a sub R. So just trust me that you actually need to do all three of these things. Um, cool. So now we like have come up with these three statements. With these three statements, if they're true, then your original range statement is true. So before moving on, I need to have like introduce another mathematical building block that allows you to combine statements. So the same way that we got a challenge scalar last time, and you know previously in the inner product group, here let's just pretend we have a challenge scalar. Let's not worry about how we get it, but it's just random and it's not zero. If a equals zero and b equals zero, then you can actually combine these two statements together into one statement using this random challenge by saying a plus bx equals zero. And as long as x is random, then with extremely high probability, uh, this last statement will be true if and only if a equals zero and b equals zero. Does this make sense? Let's see. Uh, and if you want to be malicious uh, and also to check your understanding, can someone tell me what x has to be in order to make maliciously make uh, and x such that a plus bx equals zero, even if a and b do not equal zero. Uh, zero, yeah, that's true, yes. Uh, and also, you can set x as equal to a divided by b, and that would also give you maliciously a way to, um, you know, circumvent this uh, double like, combination step. So we just have to check x is not equal to zero and sample x from such a large space that the probability that it's a equal to a divided by b is so small that we don't really worry about it. Um, and in practice, we sample x from like 2 to the 255 minus 19, so like we're fine. Don't worry about it. Um, cool. So we can actually do this multiple times. Don't be scared. This is the same idea. We can do this multiple times by instead of using x once, we can multiply the first one by nothing, the second one by, well here our column scalar is y, by y, our third one by y squared, so on and so forth, and everyone has a different exponent of y. And the reason that we're allowed to do this is because if y is random, then taking y to a certain exponent is also going to give you something that is random uh, in that space. And so, the uh, way that we write this combination is the inner product of a and b times the vector of y to the n equals zero. So it's a little bit like, weird syntax, but that's just how we write it. And so since the prover can't predict y, the uh, latter statement, this like inner product of a and b times y to the n equals zero, is true with very high probability. All right, so this is our building block. Uh, I'm just showing you how you can use random challenges to combine a bunch of statements together. And hopefully you also like have a little like inkling of like, hmm, this is interesting because this last statement is actually an inner product statement. So like remember how this whole journey is like us trying to start with a range proof or a range statement and ending up with an inner product. This is actually a tool that we'll use to get to that inner product. So the way that we'll use this tool is that the verifier gives us a random column scalar y. So this comes from somewhere. In practice, it comes from the Fiatchian heuristic. Then we rewrite the second two statements because the first statement is already like in the inner product proof form. So we're like already pretty pretty well along there. But the second two statements, we use this y to combine the statements together into inner product forms. So once again, uh, originally uh, the second statement a sub l times a sub r equals zero, the vector of zeros, is actually multiple statements. It's n statements, one statement for each index of a sub l and a sub r. And what we actually do is we're combining all of those statements by multiplying each of those statements by a different power of y, and then we're combining them in one inner product argument. So this is just the format um, that we you know, write it in once we combine it with y, and then we do the same for the second one. Cool. So. How are you feeling about that? We use this challenge scalar, now we like do some crazy stuff, end up in, in three inner product arguments. All right. And then we do it again. <laughs> um, now we take a random challenge scalar z, and um, our arguments, remember how 
thing, if a equals zero and b equals zero, then like a plus b times the challenge scale of x equals zero. So we're doing the exact same thing here. Uh, here we have uh, v equals a sub l in a product of two to the n, which you can actually rewrite as zero equals v, sorry, zero equals a sub l in a product of two to the n minus v. Uh, and what you do is you just multiply that by z squared, multiply the second thing by z, multiply the third thing by z to the zero, nothing. Uh, and then you end up with this statement. Cool. Now you have one statement. Remember how our goal is to get it in one statement that is one inner product argument. So we're really close. We have one statement that's three inner product arguments. And then we do some math that I'm not going to bore you with that's basically just algebra. You just like take some things apart and rearrange them. And then you end up with this um, inner product statement equals this thing on the right. So um, if you're curious about what that math is, it's, we wrote it up here. It's really not, I, I promise you, it's not actually that interesting. Um, but look here, here on the right, this is exactly the format that we want. We want an inner product argument where the thing on the left, inner product with the thing on the right, equals C. So we can essentially represent, uh, we can think of the thing before the comma as A, and the thing after the comma as B, and the thing after the equals as C. So, to recap, we have, or sorry, L and R, I forget the, uh, the letters that I used. But to recap, this is our journey. We started with a range statement. We broke it up into three separate statements that must all be true if this range is actually, if the values are plain range. And then we applied these like random challenge scalars such that we could rearrange all three of these into one inner product argument. And that is basically in the same format as what we wanted. T is in the inner product of L and R. And uh, going all the way back to the beginning, now that it's in this inner product argument, if and only if this inner product is true, then the V is in range. And we have a really efficient way in O of log N to prove that this inner product is true. Cool, so it comes full circle. Um, yeah, and then this is L, R, and T of the inner product. So, um, before I move on to how this is actually kind of oversimplifying it, I want to make sure that this, this simplification makes sense to everyone. Anyone have questions? Questions, questions. Yes. Yes, for sure. So, so the first part is we took this y, and we took the y to rewrite each of these. So now we have, like, here on the right-hand side, oops, here on the left-hand side, we now have three statements, and these three statements have to be true. But we want some way to like somehow smush all of these three statements into one statement. So like, if we're not looking at all of the like annoying math, but we just have three statements that are like a equals zero, b equals zero, c equals zero, and you wanted to represent that as just one statement, what you can do is you can take like a random number, z in this case, and you can say uh, if a plus b times z plus c times z squared equals zero, then with extremely high probability, we know that all our, all our three individual statements, a equals zero, b equals zero, c equals zero, those are all true. So that's exactly what we're doing here. We're multiplying the first thing by z squared, multiplying the second thing by z, multiplying the third thing by z to the zero, or nothing. Um, and then and that gives us the equation on the right. And then we just move the v to the end, just because it's prettier that way. Um, cool, does that, does that answer your question? Okay, I saw one other hand. Yeah. Ooh, oh, oh man. I was hoping that, you know, <laughs> this delta represents all of the messy craziness that we don't actually want to write out. Uh, and I think if we go on in the next slides, the same way that in the previous slide I was like, these are things that I'm not diving into even deeper. Um, that's one of the things where delta just uh, represents everything that is like, public knowledge. So delta is not any, uh, doesn't have anything that's secret in it. The prover and the verifier both know what's, what's in delta. And that's why we can just abstract it into this delta nice um, thing. Because it doesn't contain anything too important or too secret. Uh, cool, any other questions? All right, so that's actually a good segue into the next section, which is that, um, as you might notice, a sub l minus z on the, like, uh, the, the left hand side of the inner product, if you were to just send that to the prover, oh sorry, if you were to just send that to the verifier, 
the verifier will just learn what your ASIC L is, and then be like, oh, like, I know your secret, ha <laughs> um, So that's like actually sort of silly. Um, and so what we actually do in practice is we make commitments to what's on the left and the right of the inner product. And then really nice, uh, and then also Z squared times B. So like these are things that we actually want to make commitments to, and we will send over the commitments instead of sending over the plain secrets. What does that look like? Um, maybe first I should you know, review what commitments are. So if you have an additively homomorphic commitment, like I mentioned way at the beginning of the talk, then if you have some secrets, A plus B equals C plus D, then your commitments will also maintain the additive property of those secrets. So then the commitment of A plus the commitment of B would be equal to the commitment of C plus the commitment of D. And then similarly, this also extends to multiplication by scalar. So if you have two times E equals F, then two times the commitment of E equals the commitment of F. So you don't have to worry about how this works, you can just sort of treat this as a black box. Um, if you do want to learn about how this works, it's really just a Peterson commitment, and it's really straightforward, you're just multiplying by a group element and adding a black factor times another group element that's orthogonal. It's not that crazy, I'm also happy to dive into that more. Uh, but if you want to treat this as a black box, then basically all you do is you start out with the thing on the left of the inner product, the thing on the right of the inner product, and the thing on the outside, and you just make commitments to them. And if the inner product of those commitments is true, then with extremely high probability, then the secrets inside those commitments are also true. So that's really nice. That's uh, sort of the magic of an additively homomorphic commitment scheme. And in practice, that's what we do. So as a recap, uh, let's see. Yeah, so um, as a recap, uh, this sort of takes us full circle. We can send over this inner product argument without fearing that we're revealing any secrets. So things that I omitted are how the Schwann scalars are generated, uh, how the commitments work in detail. Um, once again, they're just Peterson commitments. And I also skipped over how the values are blinded. Um, that's part of how the commitments work. So if you want a deeper dive into that, I'm also happy to talk about that, but it's okay just treating it as a black box and being like, yes, that is how it works. Um, so the end result of you know, we understood the paper, we implemented it, um, and then these are our end results. Oh, I forgot to include that it's less than one millisecond per 64 bit range proof verification, um, and that's even without batching. So if you were to batch, you can get multiple verifications um, in even less time. And so, yeah, that, that's our numbers. Um, and I think that's all of the material that I have for today. Um, I'm also happy to talk about you know, how we use this and other ways to abstract, you know, bullet proofs over um, arbitrary statements instead of only over range proofs. So maybe, um, let's start with some questions. Let's see if I'm doing on time. Let's start with some questions about the actual, like, math part of this talk, and then maybe after that, I'll just take requests for other things that you want to hear about. Um, any questions about the math? Anything that you missed, I'm happy to do with you. Yes. Uh, yes, great question. So the reason that we do this, um, well we meaning really like Benedict who wrote the paper, um, the reason that he does this is because then you have a really cool property where uh, here you actually get the x of the b low, to, uh, sorry, the x that is uh, x inverse attached to the b low to cancel out the x and a low. So here, let me just like, review how this works. So if you have the inner product of this with this, what you're actually doing is you're taking this and multiplying it by this, and that gives you a low times b low, or a low inner product with b low. And then here, the x inverse here cancels out with x here, and that gives you a high inner product with b high. And so that's just a nice sort of math trick. Um, and if we didn't have that like, canceling out property, we actually wouldn't be able to reconstruct c from um, C prime. So, good question. Um, that, that is really cool. Cool. Any other um, questions about math? Yes, hi. Did you say that somewhere? Yes, um, it is at this, so the URL is kind of long, but it's, um, sorry. I also have these slides online. 
if you want to just like review the slides. It's docinternal.dalek.rs slash bulletproofs. If you just go to that, you can navigate all the notes. Um, the distinction between, I'm so sorry, I should make the URL bigger. Um, the distinction between doc internal and doc, like external, just doc, is that the doc.dalek.rs actually gives you the API and all the documentation for the API for how to use this, whereas doc internal gives you an internal look at the map. And this is a really nice thing that we have because we made everything in Rust. We have like Rust documentation for mapping. Um, yeah, awesome. Okay, uh, any other questions about the math? And if not, um, I can take requests for things that you would like to hear about that are sort of above and beyond this. I can, choices of like what I can talk about. I have, uh, we worked a lot on constraint systems, which is basically how to build an arbitrary statement and then make a proof about it. Uh, I can talk about Cloak, which is how we build the confidential assets protocol using all of this. I can talk about CKVM, which is like a smart contract language that we built on top of all of this. Anyone super excited about any of those things? Yes. Oh, definitely. Um, yeah, Merlin's really cool. Um, I don't, I might have slides for it, but basically um, the idea is when you have a paper that says, like, the prover gives something to the verifier. The verifier like does this random challenge sampling and then gives a challenge back. Um, in the paper, usually they say like, this is an interactive coin protocol. We naively, like obviously just use the fiat from your heuristic to make this non-interactive. And then as an implementer, you're like, what? <laughs> like how? And so Merlin is basically a strobe-based transcript protocol that Henry made. Henry was one of my colleagues who helped with the Bulletproofs implementation. We were working on like, how do we make this non-interactive? And he was like, this would be a really good reason, like, uh, use case for a library that takes care of all of that for you. Uh, in practice for papers, when you implement the fiat in your heuristic, a lot of times people just hash the things that the prover gives to the verifier. You're like, we just hash this, and then we take the, uh, the challenge from it, and then we use the challenge, such as, sorry, here's an example. If you wanted to take a challenge, like here, for instance, x, like where does this x come from? And a lot of times, uh, a lot of the time people just like take, for example, the vector a and hash it, take the vector b and hash it, combine them somehow, and get the challenge x. But this is uh, sort of easy to misuse or easy to get a little bit wrong, uh, and also really complicated if you're doing multiple rounds of this. And so that's why Henry made Merlin, which is effectively a black box where you're like, I put my randomness in here. I don't have to worry about what happens behind the scenes, and I get some randomness back that I have guarantees about um, that is actually fully random, that is domain separated, um, you don't have like hash collisions, things like that. So that's um, that's actually, and so that's where we get X from. We actually use the Merlin uh, transcript to get X, to get the Y, to get the Z for all of these random challenge scalars. Yeah. Anything else? Anyone want to hear about any other things? I can also be done. <laughs> Lee more. Okay. Um, I think the coolest thing um, that we built on top of this is the cloak protocol. So let me just pull up my slides for that. Sorry. All right, so um, I guess maybe to back up. Uh, so Bulletproofs is not just a range proof protocol. It's a, cons they call it in the paper, they call it a circuit proof uh, protocol as well, where you can take any arbitrary arithmetic circuit and then make a proof that it is correct over some inputs while keeping those inputs secret. Um, it turns out that coding up arithmetic circuits is like a huge pain, and so we actually just change the representation to a constraint system. Um, they're really easily translatable from one to the next, but the constraints are a little bit easier to talk about. So you have a multiplicative constraint, which is you have three variables, and you have the additional constraint that x times y equals z for each of those secret variables. And you also have a linear constraint, which is like some linear combination of secret variables with clear text weights. So these are like the tools that you have with which to build up this constraint system. And with a constraint system, you can actually represent anything that is efficiently verifiable. So by this I mean any entity complete program can be, you know, uh, changed into or represented as a constraint system. Uh, so that's pretty nice. Uh, fun side note is that the extension that my colleague Oleg made over this constraint system protocol uh, 
actually uh, broadens the things that you can represent from NP complete to uh, P space. So like if you're a uh, theory nerd, that's like pretty fun, but if you're not, it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, so you can represent basically any program you want as a constraint system. So what we wanted to do was to make a confidential assets protocol. And uh, confidential assets is like a lot harder to make than a confidential transaction protocol because you want to keep the asset types uh, secret. And so like naively, if you're just like, I want to add together all of the sums of all of the different asset types, then you'd have to specify which assets are the same, and that would reveal which assets are which uh, over enough analysis. So you can't just sort of, sort of sum together things the same way that you do for confidential transactions with one asset type. So what we came up with was sort of multiple gadgets that we composed together. So um, on the right hand side we have a range gadget, that's what we call it, which is a collection of constraints that basically make sure that the variables in the constraint system are in range. And then we add some new ones. So a shuffle gadget is basically a collection of constraints that make sure that the inputs and the outputs are a valid reordering of each other. So you can't just introduce a new input, introduce a new output, then the shuffle gadget would fail. Um, and then there's a merge gadget, which either merges two inputs into one or just moves them without altering. Same with split. Split either splits one item into two or it moves the two inputs to the two outputs without altering it at all. So um, I guess before I jump into how this is all assembled, intuitively, if you're dealing with multiple assets and you want to have some way to like prove that your input to this like protocol and your output to this protocol are valid, you want to prove that your inputs have been rearranged in such a way that the asset types are preserved, um, but without creating or destroying value. So this is really tricky because you can't actually reveal what asset groupings you have. So this is like a, a fine, like, it, it took us a while to come up with this solution. But what it was, it's basically, we first, uh, we, we group these gadgets together such that any output reordering is a valid, like actual, you know, transaction output reordering that uh, of the inputs should be able to satisfy this collection of gadgets. Um, let me walk you through why this is the case, or like how we would actually prove this. So suppose that your inputs are five dollars, three yen, and four dollars. What you, as the prover, would do, since you have the secrets, um, you would look at this and be like, okay, well, I know that I have to group all of my assets that are of the same kind together into the same chunks. So you're going to use the shuffle to reorder this such that your dollar amounts are together and your yen is at the very end. Then you will merge your dollar amounts into one lump sum, and you'll merge it again. Well, you will, because you only have one. And then you shuffle it such that your non-zero values are at the very top of the shuffle for each asset type. And then this is the part that's like, hopefully the intuition, is that you'll then split your lump sum into whatever your target amounts are. So here our output target amounts are three yen, six dollars, and three dollars. So you'll take your nine dollars and split it into six dollars and three dollars. And the yen will be below because it's just one output. And then just to preserve the randomness of your output, you'll shuffle it one more time. You'll apply a range check to it to make sure that none of these are negative. And then you get your outputs. And so if your outputs are valid, then you should be able to do this successfully. If your outputs are not valid, suppose that one of your outputs you wanted to make it $100, you would not actually be able to correctly satisfy all of these gadgets. One of these gadgets would be like, wait, where'd this extra money come from? Like, this is not a valid constraint satisfaction. So this is the intuition for how it works. And then for a verifier, the verifier actually only receives these commitments to the inputs and commitments to the outputs. And it can't tell what happened within each of the gadgets because all of these are just blind commitments to the verifier. But all they can do is verify that, yes, indeed, this proof succeeded or this proof failed. And then, you know, valid or invalid transaction. Um, so that's the, that's the intuition for cloak. And uh, I think the important thing to illustrate here is like this is just one of many uses for the Bulletproof Constraint System API that you can come up with. Uh, we just sort of made this by hand after figuring out what would make sense as a way to build it. Um, and anyone else can make, basically make their own protocols and proofs as well. So that's cool. That's my little add on. I think I'm out of time. Do I have time for questions maybe? Or should I just. All right, any questions about last bit? Yes.
Yeah, so here at the very end, we have a range check. And so basically, the output of the third shuffle, right here, is 3 yen, $6, and $3, right? And we just want to add a range check that all of those values are between 0 and 2 to the n for some large n. For example, if we wanted to like maliciously make a $100 output, then we would basically end up with shuffle three, and we'd want to somehow make like $100 as one of the outputs, and then negative, math is hard, negative 92 something, another negative number, um, but then that would fail a range check. So basically the range check makes sure that we can't make extra money. Sorry, uh, you can ask me more questions afterwards, I'm being cut off. Thank you for all of your attention.